hey, our brother Chuck is going to speak to us this morning, and he's asked that we read from Romans 8, um, starting in verse 26. Just so you know, the title of his talk is The Conversion of Saul. So it's Romans 8, 26 through 36. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that in everything God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn? Is it Christ Jesus who died? Yes, who was raised from the dead? who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who, will, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Okay, so let's give our attention to our brother Chuck. And again, he's titled his talk, The Conversion of, of Saul. Good morning. The real significance of our reading from Romans 8 is not just the generalizations about life on this earth, but when you consider the man who wrote it, the Apostle Paul, it rings true with an even deeper depth because he wasn't just spouting about theology, he was talking about life, and in particular, his life. These were things that he learned. As it turns out, he had a lot to learn. and We'll figure that out a little bit later this morning. And I will be adding some to the text, but I, I think I'm doing it with common sense. And if there are errors in my extrapolation, I claim that they are my own. But with that, let's take a look at Acts chapter 9. I think it's chapter 9. I didn't note it here. It says, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Is that chapter 9? Good. Okay, so Saul was breathing threats and violence. This symbolizes his words, you know, that he's saying things that are threatening, and he's saying that they deserve some violent fate. But it also gives us insight into his purpose. Remember how 
God gave Adam life by his breath. And now Saul's breath is dedicated to threats and even murder. So this indicates how deeply he was set on seeing this through. He was determined to stomp out this teaching against the traditions that he received. It also suggests that every breath he took and every word he said was pointed in the same direction. Saul was a Satan to the apostles and to those who followed them. He certainly spoke against them, and in his pharisaical mind, they were guilty of blasphemy, and they deserved to die. They'd been hounded out of sight in Jerusalem, and now he turned his sights elsewhere. We can surmise that he had heard they were still preaching in public, but now some of those same people were down the road to the north in Damascus. Saul went to the high priest himself to obtain letters of authority that would be recognized by the synagogues of Damascus. They might have evaded Saul's justice in Jerusalem, but they would have to do something more than just move to the next town. He would stamp out this false religion before it could spread any more than it already had. So Saul headed out for Damascus with written authority to arrest these lawbreakers. He would not be able to physically coerce the, the unwilling to go with him. So we can assume that he had a squad of deputies to guard and transport his prisoners. He would find these people and bring them to justice before the high priest in Jerusalem. Verse 3. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Saul had almost completed his journey to Damascus when something very unusual happened. A brilliant light flashed around him, and he fell to the ground. The ancients referred to the highest sky as heaven, so I interpret this as a light from the sky. And we don't know if it was day or night, but this was no ordinary light. I'm assuming that Saul was traveling during daylight hours because it's safer and because he had the means to travel when he chose. A lesser light could dazzle you at night, but during daylight hours, this must have been a glorious light. <coughs> he fell to the ground and then he heard a voice. I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Saul knew that Jesus had been killed, but his followers were claiming that he was still alive. And now Saul heard the voice of this man, Jesus, after witnessing a light like the glory of God. Now, this was certainly something for him to think about. Perhaps he would normally consider returning to Jerusalem, where he could call the shots himself. But this Jesus told him to continue, to go on into Damascus, where he would receive further instructions. Verse 7. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Saul did not travel alone, and he was not alone in hearing this voice. The men could not see who was speaking, but they heard the voice too. Now Saul had lost his vision, and he had to be led into the city like a blind man. He was blind for three days. And during this time, he fasted. He neither ate nor drank, 
and presumably he prayed for God to explain these things and help him to understand. This descent into darkness was a symbolic death for Paul, like three days in the deep for Jonah or three days in the grave like Jesus. He had some time to think and time to put things into perspective. First of all, what could cause something like this? Am I sick? Do I need a doctor? Was I hit with a rock? But he would have heard from his companions about the voice. They heard it too. They knew what was happening and they heard the same voice. So this had to be real. But, but if it was real, how could this be Jesus? If it was Jesus, then the apostles were right about his resurrection. Verse 10. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man named for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So now the Lord appeared a second time, this time to Ananias. Everything we need to know about Ananias is summed up in his answer. Here I am, Lord. This was Moses' answer when God called to him from the burning bush. And this was Samuel's answer to the still, small voice. Ananias knew who was speaking, and he was ready to go. The Lord sent Ananias, Ananias to find Saul of Tarsus. Now, we can make too much about a street called Straight, but the result is that Ananias would go straight to Saul. This street was thought to be a wide boulevard that cut directly across the city. Ananias was reasonably afraid of this man because he'd heard what Saul did in Jerusalem and he'd already heard that Saul was coming with the authority of the chief priests behind him. But the Lord had a different plan for Saul. He would be a witness who would testify before kings, before Gentiles, and he would testify to the sons of Israel, and he would suffer for the sake of the name. Verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me to you so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Ananias obeyed. He went to Saul, witnessed to him, prayed over him, and Saul regained his sight. Notice how quickly he was healed. This happened immediately. And then he was baptized. But where was his baptismal interview? Where did he learn the hope of the gospel? Well, Saul was well grounded in the Old Testament. And he knew how to identify a disciple of Jesus by what they were teaching. So he already knew the gospel, but he refused to believe it until Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Once he knew Jesus was alive, 
all the pieces fell into place. Saul had now become a believer, a disciple, and he would become an apostle. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, verse 20, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Saul stayed with the disciples for a few days. Now these were opportunities for him to form friendships, but also an opportunity for discussing the scriptures together. Because Saul knew what was written, but now he would discover how much was prophesied about the Lord Jesus. And he talked about these things in the synagogue, where he proclaimed Jesus to be the Son of God. This was amazing to those who anticipated his visit with fear and confounding to the Jews who had no answer for a scholar like Saul. Verse 23. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. The Jews could not constrain Saul with superior logic, and they could not convolute his arguments from the scriptures. But they had to stop him before he persuaded everyone to follow Jesus. They had to silence this man. And when they realized there was no other way, they began plotting to kill him. But this plot became known, and the disciples helped him to escape Damascus, lowering him safely outside the wall. Verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea, and they sent him away to Tarsus. So, when Saul returned to Jerusalem, he tried to continue the work that he had started in Damascus. And he wanted to associate with the disciples. But they weren't ready to trust him. They were still afraid of him. So Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how the Lord had appeared to him and began preaching in the name of Jesus. Saul could move freely around Jerusalem, and he worked with the apostles preaching boldly in the city where believers lived in fear. Here he argued from the scriptures against the Greek-speaking Jews, but they came to the same conclusion as the brethren in Damascus. We have to stop this man. So they started working to have Saul put to death. When the brethren learned that the Jews in Jerusalem were planning to kill Saul, they brought him down to the sea, and they sent him away from the murderous politics of Jerusalem and on to Tarsus, where he had friends and family. Verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. 
It continued to increase. The confrontation with the Jews had revealed the character of both parties. But the timing of God and the wisdom of the apostles had saved Saul for the work to come. The result was a time of peace for those preaching the word of God. And Jesus was preached freely everywhere in Judea and in Galilee and in Samaria. The ecclesia of God was built up in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the fear of the Lord, the effect of which was a growing movement of believers who followed the living God of Israel, looking forward to the promises of God to be fulfilled in his coming kingdom on earth. Now, in some ways, I wish that the history ended here. The apostles were safe. The gospel was preached. The ecclesias were growing. If it was up to me, that would be a good place to park the story, wouldn't it? But Jesus had spoken plainly about suffering. In particular, the suffering of the apostle that we know as Paul. This Saul is the Paul who wrote a large portion of the New Testament. And as I noted in our reading this morning from Romans 8, it changes things a bit when you remember who it was that wrote it. Paul would face terrible opposition, persecution, and physical punishment because of what he preached. In time, he would face imprisonment and finally even death. But in the process, he would contribute entire books to the collection that we know as the Bible. And much of what we know comes through his writings. The principles of godliness have always been passed on in writing. But the Apostle Paul laid out the Old Testament basis of his faith in Jesus and how Jesus fulfilled the word of God's prophets. And in that, he was uniquely suited to prove God is at work in the kingdoms of men. So, what did this mean to Jesus? And what does this mean for us? Jesus taught a gospel of repentance where people could be forgiven if they were ready to change. And this offer of grace was sent from God himself, and it was shared with all mankind. We were not doomed because we did something wrong if we were willing to make it right. This was a principle of restoration explained in the law of Moses. If you did something wrong, go back and make it right. The Apostle Paul needed to learn about repentance, but he learned it. He learned it well, and he passed it on to anyone who would listen. Paul learned that he, too, needed to repent, and he came to know how much he was forgiven. This is fundamental to understanding his incredible motivation. Once he was convinced Jesus was alive and Jesus was sending him on a mission, he was dedicated to spreading the good news. Jesus taught about the resurrection of the dead. This was a reversal of the process of death and a reenactment of the creation of man in the garden. The dust of the earth would be gathered together and infused with the breath of life. The person who was laid in the earth would be raised to stand on his feet this is central to the gospel that was preached. The promises of God were beginning to be fulfilled with Jesus as the first of many who would be raised to inherit immortality. Now, Paul was a Pharisee, so he had already confessed to the possibility of resurrection. But the resurrection of Jesus as the beginning of a multitude well, this was a new thing. And the personal resurrection of Paul was suddenly a real possibility. 
Paul could be completely forgiven for everything he had done. And he was eligible for resurrection from the dead. What could be a greater blessing than that? And it was already there. He had seen it when Jesus appeared to him. So, what can we learn from Saul's conversion? You can be dead wrong and you can still recover. How about that? I was wrong on some very important things when I came to understand the hope of the scriptures. I was pointed, I was headed in the ways of death and I didn't even recognize that there was a better alternative. I can still be wrong but I don't have to keep going that way. I can try something new and I can learn new habits. I can correct my mistakes and so can you. We can turn around again. It's not always enough to simply stop doing something. We need to do something else. And the best thing to do is something that pulls us in another direction. Sometimes we have to act our way into a new way of thinking. Thank you, Brother Norm Zilmer. He taught me that. Repentance means turning away from or turning around again. If we do the right thing for the right reason, understanding may follow. But we have to turn around. We can be forgiven anything except closing our hearts against God. We might think we have no alternative. We were born bad, or our parents never loved us, or any of a hundred excuses, but we can set all that aside and simply accept God's forgiveness. He's ready to forgive even before we ask, and it's his glory to forgive those who are willing to listen to him. Jesus choosing of us is more important than our choosing of him. Our decision to follow Jesus, to be baptized, to decide to commit our lives to follow him is very important. But that's just the beginning. We come to know that Jesus chooses us too. And that makes what we do important. Jesus is still at work in the world, and we are working with him. We are working for him. And this gives meaning to all that we do. Faith, hope, and love can involve suffering. And it probably will. It was the Apostle Paul who pointed out that human knowledge would find its limit and miraculous powers would pass away. But faith, hope, and love will endure. When we consider the Apostle Paul, it is his faith, his hope, and his love that shine through as brightly as that light he saw on the road to Damascus. But he paid a price. When the apostles were afraid, Paul spoke out boldly. There was opposition, and there was trouble, and there was suffering. But Paul had already measured this in the balance. He counted everything to be worthless garbage compared to everything that he gained in Christ. And finally, nothing can separate us from the love of God. No matter what we face, it's never enough to break that contact between us and the living God. And that's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. In closing, I'd like to pick up just after our reading this morning in Romans 8 starting at verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. 
For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Chuck, for those encouraging words. We certainly can see in Paul's life uh, a <clears throat> path to salvation, especially from it's so good to see how to get salvation when you're kind of going in the opposite direction. Um, but let's uh, rejoice in our salvation uh, as we remember Jesus through the bread and the wine. Uh, but first, we'll sing a hymn together. Hymn 224. According to thy gracious word before thine agony, this will we do, our absent Lord, we will remember thee. Hymn 224. Mm -hmm. 
good to think about the conversion of Saul and the man he became. It reminds me of a couple of things that sometimes the people that you would least expect to be changed are changed. People that you would think, you know, there's no hope for this person. He's so ingrained or entrenched in his way of thinking or her way of thinking that there's no possibility that they could change. And yet, look at Paul. I mean, he was at one time uh, holding the garments of the people that took them off so they could get a better shot at uh, Stephen for stoning him, and yet he changed. Another thing is, that, you know, I, I'm sure Paul encountered this, um, is that once you are changed, you think, you know, everybody will listen to you. Um, that people are rational, and once you've uh, explained to them the truth of the situation, that they will listen. But that's not the case either, right? The people that you think could be converted because they maybe think similarly to you, they oftentimes aren't. I know people encounter that with their families after they've uh, been baptized, that they think, well, you know, if I just explain it to my brothers and sisters, my parents, uh, they'll surely see what is right, but that's not always the case either. Sometimes it is. We certainly should always try remembering who we are. But Paul then, of all people, was sent to the Gentiles. Um, it says this in uh, Acts 15. Um, so being sent on their way, uh, Paul and Barnabas, by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, reporting the conversion of the Gentiles, and they gave great joy to all the brethren. So this man, who you know was an unlikely conversion himself, he's now going to Gentiles, who's very unlikely to convert, and he's convincing them of what they need to do which is great for us, because that's who we are. We were converted, all of us. Any of us who have uh, taken on the name of Christ have had a conversion, and maybe more than one, uh, maybe more than one time. We have changed our path, um, stopped by Christ maybe in mid-path and said, you need to go a different way. <coughs> So that is who we remember now. And it, it certainly is Christ who is guiding us, even though he's not, uh, we can't see him guiding us. He is doing it. We are his bride, his uh, chosen ones. And as long as we heed his call, he will guide us through life. Sometimes it's painful. Um, sometimes it's joyful as when they're reporting conversions here. Um, but it's always good if we follow our uh, Master and Savior. So that is what we are doing as we remember him now. And as we sang, we will do this. We will uh, remember our Lord and Savior through the bread and the wine. It's our, our path or our way to stay stable and, and go in the right direction once we humble ourselves and uh, realize what we need to do. So let's do remember Jesus at this time, uh, the Son of God who gave his life for us, who God sent to give his life for us. Let's remember him first through taking up the bread, and we'll ask Brother Russ to offer a prayer at this time. Loving Father, we come before you in all humbleness. As we heard this morning, 
gall of them. And as we partake of this bread, we see that it is your word made manifest, that manna that didn't perish, that everlasting manna. As we, we've seen this morning the change it made in lives, in Paul's life. Saul, Saul the Paul. saw that they too were involved in this conversion. Uh, so as we partake of this bread, we see the we the flesh is crucified. That there are issues that Saul went through went through and we go through. And that's part of our conversion. To be following up pray, Father, that as we see these things happening in our lives, as, as was demonstrated this morning through the scriptures, that we don't panic, that we are strengthened and encouraged and looking forward to the gospel and realizing that salvation comes through your Son. Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem as we ask this prayer in your Son's name. Jesus the Christ. Amen. Also, do the second part of what Jesus asked, and that was to drink up the cup so we could remember him in that way. And we'll ask our brother Ari to say a prayer. 
Father in heaven, hallowed be thy holy name. Lord, we are thankful that you are all here today. To be even happier with the, those that are missing today to be with us as well. We pray, Father, that we examine ourselves as we think of this darkness well. And we remember now that this cup represents the new covenant in the Lord Jesus blood poured out for us all the forgiveness of sin. Father, we ask for that 